How's it going guys? So, lukewarm. What does that term mean and how does it apply biblically? And how is it misused? That's kind of what I want to go over today. In the colloquial um, modern day understanding, lukewarm is essentially simply just a mix of hot and cold. Generally considered to be something that is not super useful for a lot of things. Uh, in antiquity, Roman culture, Greek culture, lukewarm water was used specifically for uh, the, 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 the practice of gorging oneself on food and then drinking lukewarm water so as to stimulate regurgitation so that the person, the pagan, could go on and celebrate their, uh, their false god by feasting, as they would call it. Um, so it, it has some um, pretty easy to understand connotations and biblically, historically, also has some um, paganistic and um, weak-willed or weak-minded associations uh, with it. And when somebody is called lukewarm, it is generally considered a slight, right? Now, in modern day understanding in the church, it's being abused by some to somehow mean that if you are called lukewarm by somebody who, unfortunately, if they're part of this modern day church, are likely themselves lukewarm, what they're saying is, is they're, they're essentially impugning you for not accepting their um, misguided view of scripture, abuse of spiritual gifts, or their what they view as spiritual gifts, tongues, prophecy, etc. When it's clear we have everything we need in the Bible, and uh, they come up with you know terms like cessationist, and again they call us lukewarm because they think that because we're not overly emotional or um, lacking sobriety of spirit and mind, that we somehow are not showing a great faith like they are, right? Uh, but the reality is, is lukewarm in a biblical sense has a deeper and somewhat, somewhat more difficult um, definition to understand. Although I, I think it's quite simple once you get into it. So essentially, uh, the Church of Laodicea, um, this is Revelation three fourteen through twenty two, are are told, and they are a church, by the way. This is another misunderstanding. Uh, that letter was written to believers. It wasn't written to unbelievers. The Bible is for believers, right? So those who are part of that church, which I have opined that is this age specifically because we're right on the cusp of tribulation. We're being told we're going to be spit out. And then in Revelation 4.1, uh, it, it clearly states that after these things, uh, the, 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 the events of the tribulation commence thereafter, right? So there's a, there's a timeline associated with it. To me, it seems to be quite clear. And our particular generation is known for being very self-reliant, very uh, sure of itself, very full of itself, and very convinced that what it has is proof that we somehow have arrived to the pinnacle of faith when really he calls us wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Um, in um, more broad terms or broad, the, the broader understanding of what that means, well, here, let's see. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Paul is getting into the Corinthians' tendency to be worldly, have friends with unbelievers, and treat each other the way that unbelievers treat each other. Uh, verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, or Baal, depending on your translation? What does the believer have in common with the unbeliever, right? Their entire basis um, for understanding this life is a selfish one-off um, that is either part of some crazy religion or only believes that somehow, some way, this life is all there is, right? So they're going to live their lives as if there's no tomorrow, YOLO, if you will, you only live once, and um, they're going to do everything they can to get what they want out of this life at the expense of any potential um, relationship or understanding of God, right? Uh, and they're going to basically, well, be selfish and and bite at each other and and be jealous of each other and have a lot of hatred and discord, right? The way of the world around us. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of that in this day. The Corinthian church was actually a really good example as to what our current church is today. Um, it was very much obsessed with showing off its spiritual gifts instead of putting them into proper use, like tongues, for example, being essentially a banging gong if nobody knew it was being spoken. Tongues are directly called by Paul a sign for unbelievers, and yet they were still barking back and forth at each other so as to somehow prove their spiritual acumen 
uh, as being greater than others and then somehow being deserving of some higher position than others based upon worldly and childish understandings. Uh, very, very lukewarm, right? Uh, Matthew 6, 24, the Lord is very, very clear. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, although one could get into, you know, the necessities of life having to be paid for by money, the reality is we're told over and over and over again to never have to really worry about worldly things, just whatever job we're doing, get into it, serve the Lord through your job and he will take care of your life. Whereas the unbeliever and unfortunately modern day Laodicea is very much self-absorbed uh, with getting someplace in this life, you know, uh, leaving their mark or, you know, having a big retirement or uh, a lot of worldly goods. And this in no way means that there's no such thing as rich believers there are. But unfortunately, that is more indicative of our time than any other statement, I would think. You know, we, we say we are rich, but really we are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, right? Um, here in the West especially, especially with all the modern technology that we have, somehow we're convinced that all of this is a blessing from God, and it truly is. However, uh, it is hijacked by Satan and his demons, very much to instill a sense of self-righteousness and um, self-indulgence that quickly leads us into trying to serve both the Lord and Satan, right? And money is unfortunately commonly behind a lot of the reasoning and logic uh, for Laodicea's approach to living a worldly life. That doesn't mean that verse specifically talks about our time because this has been an issue with humans ever since the beginning, you know, being greedy, selfish, and so on. Um, but the reality is it really comes down to wanting to serve ourselves and therefore sin and therefore Satan and wanting to serve God at the same time, right? Because the hot side of lukewarm faith is the fact that you are, again, an actual believer, but you're also dabbling in all these things that Satan has co-opted specifically to keep the unbelieving world constantly caught up in itself, right? It is the reason why the third seed, the, the, the seed among thorns, is still technically considered a believer, still ends up being saved, but becomes so invested in making a name for itself, having fancy things, bills, um, you know, toys and so on, which that's not to say that the Lord's not going to give us these things so as to pass the time because everybody is sinful and everybody needs a filler in their life. Nobody can perfectly adhere to the Bible perfectly all the time, but they should be gifts from him. They shouldn't be something that we strive after constantly. And our generation, unfortunately, is known for that. First Corinthians eleven seventeen through 19. In the following directives, I have no praise for you for your, your meetings do more harm than good, which in my opinion, is directly applying to just about every denomination in existence today. In fact, just the reason, just the reasoning behind denominations shows what I'm going to read here uh, thereafter. So verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. Now, this is also abused because people today like to say that because the group of lukewarm people that you may be having to dissociate yourself from disapproves of your behavior. They see that verse as applying to their judgment as being proper and yours being improper, but it's actually in our time far more likely that those of us that have decided to leave a church building or an established denominational organization, we are likely the ones that are being shown correct. And we also have to understand from Paul's own words, that the angels are watching. They very much are seeing God's God's character enacted and put in place regarding how he treats those who are coming from a sinful state into faith and eventually, hopefully, going on to, to know him eternally as part of his family, right? So they are very clearly seeing who is approved by God, though, unfortunately, in our time, that is not common. And in fact, I would say the exact opposite of what's really going on. Uh, Romans 12, three through eight. And on that point, by the way, uh, the ones who stay members of that church would say that those who leave are lukewarm because they don't join in on the uh, mass group activities and abuse things like saying, well, you have to commune with other believers. Uh, certainly, but as you can see by the life of Paul, specifically and the life of Christ, um, perfectly, that 
those of us that decide to stay closest to the Lord will likely even find ourselves as outcasts among other believers because they do not choose to walk in the Spirit as they should and adhere to the Lord's commands to sacrifice our life on a daily basis and walk with Him, um, basically giving up what we could go after to serve Him, to go into ministry and to help others. Let's go back to that verse, Romans 12, 3 through 8. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. We have to be sober of mind. We shouldn't be sitting around trying to pump up our emotions all the time, thinking that that somehow is a replacement for truly walking in the Spirit and truly doing the hard work that the Lord would have us do for the benefit of the, the larger body of Christ. Verse 4, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. And if it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now, notice, by the way, that prophecy is put above and beyond all of the other gifts. None of the sign gifts are mentioned there, and yet all of those are shown to be some of the most, they are the most commonly enacted spiritual gifts in our day today. And in Paul's time, obviously, he's writing scripture. He's prophesying uh, the Lord's own words, future events, through the Spirit, not on his own, perfectly portraying uh, what the Christian life should look like in, in each day that we walk, right? Uh, and again, this goes counter very much to our, again, modern day, lukewarm, full of ourselves, wanting worldly acknowledgement, and I hate to say this, church, right? That, that, that doesn't mean that these people aren't believers, but unfortunately they're not behaving as the body should. Each individual member is out there trying to all be some, what they view, grand part of the body that is somehow over and above others by truly, I hate to say it, ignoring the Bible by being friends with the world and all the things that come with that. 2 Corinthians 12.20 for I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, factions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. That right there, I think, is the most pointed verse that almost perfectly, if not perfectly, describes what's really going on today. We have a... We have an association problem. We really, 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 really want to be something in the world. So much so that we have separated ourselves based on, unfortunately, unbiblical ideals, right? Uh, we think ourselves rich, knowing it all, and doing all that we think we should be doing, when really all we'd have to do is open up the Bible and quickly be convinced and convicted of the fact that the mass majority of Christians today in Laodicea are above and beyond every other generation in our lukewarm behavior. And it really is a sad thing. And it completely explains why we are about to be spit out into the tribulation. In fact, the words are vomited out of his mouth. The end of Laodicea has one, well, one, it has many, but one specific great um, acknowledgement from the Lord that those who overcome in the end who can get above and beyond all of this lukewarm nonsense that's going on right now, maintain our faith by walking in the Spirit and holding on to the Lord no matter what, turning back to the, the water of the Word, uh, the guidance of the Spirit, and, and the deep abiding truths that are given to us in the Bible, there are going to be those of us who shake off the dust on our feet at, at this church, unfortunately. And, and it really is a bad sign. But the truth of the matter is, for those of us who are trying really hard and doing everything we can to not be lukewarm, we should take these words of encouragement to heart and know full well that he sees us, he knows us, he supports us, regardless of what the rest of this unfortunately childish generation says about us. And we should 
we should continue on in our walk and we shouldn't be anything like that. I just wanted to make sure that you guys know that when they castigate you, unfortunately, because you have to separate, but also fortunately, because God sees you and the angels acknowledge that you are on the right side of God's commands to keep going, to not stop, to keep trudging forward, keep digging deeper into the truths of the word and allow him to show you in your everyday life. Um, one of the greatest, unfortunately, defining characteristics of our time is that we run from teacher to teacher looking for them to tell us what we want to hear when the reality is that is one of the most destructive possible things in the world because it teaches each individual lukewarm, childish believer to become an authority unto themselves. And that is exactly what Satan wants from us. He wants us all thinking that our worldly points of view uh, scantily viewing Christianity as a part of their life because they think they're making it a part of their life in total when really they're just being friends of the world. Anyway, let me know what you think. Comment, like, share, subscribe. Obviously, there's a lot more to it. I just wanted to put this out there because um, we need to understand that it is not, it's not just a pejorative term. It is an actual reality that we are all up to our neck in at this moment in time right before uh, the tribulation pops off. I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, for those of you who have prayed for, for me and this, uh, this paltry ministry, which it, that's exactly what it is. I know it's, it's a nothing on the worldly scale and it will really never be anything um, that this lukewarm church will fully accept. I really appreciate you guys being here and I hope you're all doing well. Talk to you soon.